Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, for this evening, and for the warmth that we have in, uh, in the end of November here. We ask that you send your Spirit upon this group to, to enlighten our hearts and to enlighten our minds as to what the sacrament of reconciliation is, the great gift that you have given to us to ask forgiveness for our sins and to have the assurance of, of forgiveness in this beautiful sacrament. We ask that you bless the parents here, that they would be able to live as role models and examples to their children and to help guide them into your loving arms and to, to share with them your love and your message of forgiveness. So we dedicate this evening to Our Lady as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, not so very long ago, there was a German man who was feeling a little bit guilty about what he had done, so he decided to go to confession, as a good German Catholic would do. He said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I feel terrible, because in World War II, I hid a refugee in my attic. The priest said, but that's not a sin. I wouldn't feel bad if I were you. That's a good thing. The man said, but I made him pay me 50 marks for every week he stayed with me. And the priest said, well, okay, I understand. That's not a, that's not a noble thing to do, charging a man to save his life. But you did save his life anyways, and so I give you, I give you absolution. Go in peace. And the man said, oh, thank you so much, Father. That really eases my mind. Let me just ask you one more thing. Do I have to tell him the war's over? <laughs> Good, you're loosening up a little bit. Good, you're loosening up. Let me tell you one more, okay? That's right, just one more joke. Now, there was a new priest who was nervous about hearing confessions. So he asked an older priest, the pastor in his parish, to sit in and listen in on a few of his confessions just to give him some pointers. And they did that. About a half a dozen confessions later, the older pastor pulled the young, newly ordained priest out and said, okay, how about this? Why don't you put your hand on your chin, cross your arms a little bit, and say things like, I understand. Go on, my child. Now, isn't that a little bit better than slapping your knee and saying, wow, what happened next? <laughs> All right. There are, there are a lot of good joke, confession jokes. And there are, it's important to relax a little bit. It's important to kind of get into uh, a relaxed state of mind. Why? Well, because in my experience, and this might be the same for you, whenever people start talking about confession, people get nervous, right? It's a little bit of anxiety when people start talking about confession because it is an exposure of what we've done, and people don't really like that. So it's good to laugh a little bit before we get into what we're going to talk about. So what are we going to do today? As parents of your children are going to go into first reconciliation, I found that it's important, it would be good to look at these, th these things here. Quickly, we'll do a contextualization. How does the sacrament of penance fit in with baptism? We'll do that very, very quickly. And then we're going to look at objection number one, which would be sin doesn't exist. This is a very common objection in our modern society. Sin doesn't exist, and I think it would be good to look at that objection. Number two, second objection, where is confession in the Bible? This is a big one. Now, I wasn't raised Catholic. I was raised a Pentecostal Christian, and I actually had this objection when I was growing up as well. Where's sin in the Bible? Or, sorry, no, where's sin in the Bible? <laughs> Sin's in you, right? No, where's confession in the Bible? Objection three, well, why not go to God directly? Why go to confession to a priest? Just go to God directly, all right? So in the next 45, 50 minutes, I'd like to look at these three objections, kind of get, you know, and help you as much as possible, you know, to get a firm grounding to the biblical background of confession, why it's so beautiful, why it's so important, and then you can hopefully be role models to your own children, as I'm sure you already are. So, is that all right? You ready to go forward? Great. Let's do a quick contextualization. First and foremost, baptism. What happens when we're baptized? A lot of amazing, incredibly deep theological realities take place. Number one, well, actually reading from the Catechism, 1265, we've got this, this paragraph. Baptism not only purifies us from our sins, but also makes the neophyte, or the convert, a new creature, an adopted son or an adopted child of God, who has become a partaker in the divine nature, a member of Christ and co-heir with him, and a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, we obviously do not have time to talk about baptism. This is a, a, a kind of a retreat, a presentation on, of course, confession. But just really quickly, I mean, can you begin to grasp the amazing reality of what takes place when we're baptized. It's, baptism is not just a symbol where you just sort of splash with water and be like, okay, you're clean now. When, you're bapt when a baby's baptized, or an adult for that matter, 
They are made a new creature. They are an adopted child of God. So this is what makes us different than, um, than Muslims. You know, in the Islamic religion, God, Allah, is a master, and we are his slaves. In Christianity, when we are baptized, we are made a child of God. And God is our father. All right? And so we become also a partaker of the divine nature. Like God actually makes us into his children, and we share in the very life of the Trinity itself. It's really, really incredible to think about that. And so finally, you know, we're a co-heir with Christ and a temple of the Holy Spirit. All these amazing things take place in baptism, okay? So, can't spend too much more time on that, but it's important to realize that. When we're baptized, however, Catechism continues, 1264, certain temporal consequences of sin remain in the baptized, such as suffering, illness, death, and such frailties inherent in life, such as weaknesses in character, and, and so on and so forth. So we also have this inclination to sin, this tendency to sin, that tradition calls concupiscence. Or metaphorically, the catechism says, the tender for sin. Okay? So we all experience this, right? There's this temptation to sin. It, doesn't, it could be all kinds of different things, depending on what your issue is. But we have inherent in our nature, in our fallen nature, this tendency towards sin that's called concupiscence. Now, concupiscence is left, and even after baptism, we struggle with this concupiscence, with this temptation, to wrestle with it. And the catechism says, it cannot harm those who do not consent, but manfully resist it by the grace of Jesus Christ. You know, temptation to sin is not a sin. It's just a temptation. When we refuse the consent, and when we manfully resist, then we are made, we're elevated, where our faith is tested, so to speak, and we choose God above whatever it is we're tempted by. And so there's this challenge, although we've been baptized and all these great things have happened to us, we're now children of God, we're partakers of the divine nature, we're temples of the Holy Spirit, and so on and so forth, we still have this temptation. And what happens when we give in? Well, the sacrament of of confession restores us to God. It reconciles us with God. You know, the baptized, after even falling into sin, even in many cases serious sin, through this beautiful sacrament, we are restored in friendship with God, and we are made a child of God once again. And so it's called reconciliation, it's called penance, it's called confession. They're all equally valid terms because they simply explain a different aspect of the sacrament. Well, let's just look at this really quickly. Reconciliation, we're reconciled not only with God, but also with the church and with the rest of humanity, right? Because especially our brothers and sisters in the faith. It's called penance because we do penance. We've got to make amends for what we've done wrong. And it's also called confession for the simple fact that we confess that we've done something wrong. So they're all equally valid. So that's just a quick contextualization. When we sin after baptism, we go to confession and we're made right with God. So... Having said that, then, let's look at objection number one. Didn't you know sin doesn't exist? All right? Here's this <laughs> quite shocking uh, image here I found on Google Images. All right, there was some evangelical pastor somewhere, I don't even remember where, who basically said, so he put this together, original sin, how glad I am to be rid of that teaching. All right, so there's this denial to reject, and this is a Christian pastor here, rejecting original sin and, and sin in general. Well, why? Well, because what we have nowadays is just, okay, there are, sin doesn't exist. There are only mistakes or biological predispositions and so on and so forth. There are other explanations instead of sin, genetics or societal influences. Right? We're not really held accountable for what we do anymore. Have you noticed that? Like, we're not really held accountable. Responsibility isn't, you know, in vogue anymore. It's something that we've kind of tossed aside. And we, so we say some, so many other things have caused our actions. All right? But that's not the case. I mean, the Bible itself says nobody can deny sin. St. John is very, very clear about this. If we say we are without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. The truth is not in us if we say we are without sin. But... If we acknowledge our sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from every wrongdoing. So St. John, I mean, Scripture is very clear. Sin exists. All right. Now, it's interesting because I think we all experience this. I mean, as I was talking about this tendency to sin in ourselves, we know that, and St. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, there is this, this 
we want to do right, we don't want to do wrong, but yet we end up doing it. Why do we end up doing it? We, we have this interior struggle within ourselves. But if you go out in the world and you look around you, maybe even in your own families, all right, society, just watch the news. I mean, sin exists, evil exists, and it's because of our own actions. So Matthew Kelly, an amazing Catholic speaker, I have some of his CDs over there if you're interested. He has this great line. I'm stealing it directly from him. He said, if you go out and just watch the news and you still deny that sin doesn't exist, seek professional help. (laughs) Seek professional help because sin definitely exists. So, you know, what is sin, though? If it exists, and I think I'm not going to belabor the point too much, what is it? Well, the Catechism defines it like this, paragraph 1849. Sin is an offense against reason, truth, and right conscience. It is a, and here's the main point. It is a failure in genuine love for God and neighbor caused by a perverse attachment to certain goods. It wounds the nature of man and injures human solidarity. It has been defined as an utterance, a deed, or a desire contrary to eternal law. So this is really what sin is. I mean, it is, and I think I want to focus on that that particular, that second sentence, a failure in genuine love for God caused by a perverse attachment to certain goods. Sin is acting contrary to what is good and true. I mean, God is truth. God is love. And so we are called to know God as truth and to love him because he is love. And so when we sin, we are choosing something else, an inferior created good, as opposed to God. I mean, that's really what we're doing. We're choosing something else. Sometimes it's an inferior good or it is an evil itself as opposed to God. So I think that's what we need to focus on first and foremost. It's we're not loving God as we ought. And Catholicism, there's a lot of talk about Catholic guilt, right? Catholic guilt, Catholic guilt. Sort of like there's, people make jokes. It's better to be Presbyterian because it's Catholic light, you know, because that's all Catholics talk about is guilt. Now, First and foremost, guilt is, is a good, normal thing. It's sort of like I just got burned the other day, a massive burn. I had some coffee in a non-microwave safe cup. That was a bad thing. Okay, so got scalded. Pain tells me, don't put your hand on that, micro, on that, that, that cup that's not microwave safe. You're going to get hurt. Guilt's the same way for our, for our spiritual lives. When we do something wrong, our conscience says, that was wrong. Don't do it. It's the same thing. Okay, so Catholicism is not all about guilt. Catholicism is a big yes. It's a big yes to love. It's a big yes to peace, to joy, and everything that is good and right about who we are as children of God. So that's why we have Ten Commandments. That's why we have the precepts of the church. Because the church, as our Holy Mother says, if you want to be happy, if you want to be joyful, if you want to be full of love and fulfillment, follow God's commands. And I think, and this helped me a lot, I mean, in my own personal walk with God, and hopefully it will with yours as well, when we understand that Catholicism is a big yes, then we can understand and contextualize what sin is all about, a failure to love God. Does that make sense? Okay. Oh, great. Nodding heads, I like that. Not in terms of sleeping nodding heads, you know, it's a clarification. Okay, so a biblical distinction of sin. Is sin all equal? No. St. John, again, very clearly says this. If anyone sees his brother committing what is not a deadly sin, or your translation might have what is not a mortal sin, he will ask and God will give him life for those whose sin is not deadly. There is sin which is deadly. I do not say one is to pray for that. Here's the point. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin which is not deadly. So we see this distinction between mortal sin and sin that is not mortal. Because when I grew up as a, as a Pentecostal sort of non, well, yeah, Pentecostal Christian, what I was taught, and I remember this very clearly, God looks at, he, I, I, was, I learned when I was young that God looks down on our sins as if like a pilot looking down on a city, looking at all the buildings. So when a pilot looks down on all the buildings from directly above, he can't tell really, depending on the angle of course, which buildings are higher and which buildings are shorter, right? You got the image? So to God, all sin is like these buildings. You can't tell which is greater and which is you know, less grave, so to speak. But that's not the case. Clearly, uh, John is not saying that. So there is this very distinction that the church takes from Scripture, saying there is some mortal sin and some what we call venial sin. What is the difference? So first and foremost, what is a mortal sin? What's John talking about? And this is what the church teaches. Mortal sin destroys charity in the heart of man. So when we're baptized, we receive charity, the love of God in our souls. And mortal sin destroys that love of God by a grave violation of God's law. 
it turns man away from God, who is his ultimate end and his beatitude and his happiness, by preferring an inferior good to him. So essentially, when we commit a grave sin, a deadly sin, we're saying, and it's got to be a major sin, like uh, you go, just go down the list of the Ten Commandments, all right, adultery, theft, stealing, and it gets a little bit more complicated than that. But essentially, you go down the Ten Commandments, committing a grave sin, you turn away from God. You say, I don't want the love of God in my heart anymore. I want this thing, this inferior good. And it destroys charity. So you've got skull and crossbones there. All right? Your relationship with God has just been destroyed because you, cho- you freely chose it that way. Now, that's different than what's called the venial sin, a minor sin. It's still wrongdoing, but it's not grave. It's not mortal. And this is what the catechism says. Venial sin weakens charity. It manifests a disordered affection for created goods. It impedes the soul's progress in the exercise of the virtues and the practice of moral good. It merits temporal punishment. We'll talk about that later. Deliberate and unrepented venial sin disposes us little by little to commit a mortal sin. However, venial sin does not break the covenant with God. So what's going on? Essentially, it's a minor thing. It might be uh, an unwilling, sometimes it's unwilling, sometimes it is willing, you know, say something that's wrong or to sort of finagle your way out of a difficult situation because you don't want to take the blame or whatever it might be. All right, a venial sin is something that's not grave. However, it disposes us, if it's deliberate and unrepented, it, it disposes us to grave sin. For example, I'll take, I'll take a delicate situation here, okay? But I think it really will prove the point, so bear with me. Say, for example, an individual, just say for simplicity's sake, a man, likes to walk just in his normal life, he takes second glances at pretty women all the time. Just second glance, third glance, checks them out. All right, that is a deliberate... All right, venial sin, depending on how you might look at it, might be mortal. But it's, it's not as grave as, say, adultery per se. But say, for example, he deliberately does, does that and doesn't repent. That might dispose him more and more to what? To maybe going on the computer and getting in trouble on the computer. And then maybe if he continues to do that, it would dispose him to complete infidelity in his marriage. You see how sin begets sin. Gradually, little by little, if we do not repent of it. So it's still serious. I mean, it would beat us up a little bit here, but yet you're still alive. Okay, so what makes a mortal sin? I think there's a lot of confusion on this point. What, how, do, how does one commit a mortal sin in the begin, to begin with? Three conditions must be met. Number one, it's got to be grave matter. All right, Sexual immorality or theft or lying or whatever it might be. Just look at the Ten Commandments. But here's the key. It's got to be committed with full knowledge and deliberate consent. Someone's got to say, look, I'm about to do what I'm going to do. I know this is a serious sin. I don't care. I'm doing it anyways. That's a mortal sin. That person has freely chosen to reject God, turn their back on God, and just give in to their temptation to this grave sin. That's what makes a mortal sin. Okay? Now, really quickly, I just want to say that there are different kinds of punishments for sin. Okay? Number one, there's eternal punishment. And I, I don't want to beat around the bush. I don't, want to, I don't enjoy bringing up difficult topics, but hell exists. Jesus talks about hell more than the entire Bible combined. Did you know that? Jesus talks about hell more than the entire Bible combined because he loves us and he wants us to spend eternity with him. So he's trying to warn his disciples, don't commit sin. Turn towards me, follow me, carry your cross, and so on and so forth. So when we sin, we merit an eternal punishment. And all that is is just separation from God. That's all really the greatest punishment for us in separation from God. But there's also temporal punishment. Remember, we, admit, we just saw that in the catechism paragraph, and I said, well, what is that? Well, sometimes our sins have actual consequences. If a man is unfaithful to his wife and decides to leave his family and follow his secretary, to, that's going to have natural consequences in the family's life. Even if he repents of that and tries to come back to his family years later, his wife is hurt and destroyed. His children are hurt and de- well, destroyed. I mean, it's hard to rebuild that relationship, okay? But even the minor sins, all right? So take, for example, an analogy where maybe you've got this young child here. His nose is in the corner, right? She was playing baseball in the living room. And mom said, don't play baseball in the living room. And I guess that's a girl right there in the picture. She went out and decided to play baseball in the living room and broke mom's very expensive, beautiful vase, all right? Because vase is expensive, vase is when it's not really expensive. Okay, so her her beautiful vase. All right, and then of course, she, you know, the child is distraught. She disobeyed mom. Mom could forgive her of of her sin, really her disobedience, but she might. I mean, this 
this particular girl might be too young, but say she's older, mom might say, now you need to go out and do some chores, do some babysitting, do whatever you need to do to earn the money to replace the vase, or at least part of it, you know, to restore it. That's temporal punishment. You've got to make it right, atone for your mistakes. Does that analogy help to explain a little bit about the difference? So when we go to confession, when we have this eternal punishment right here, and we are brought back into right relationship with God, eternal punishment becomes eternal forgiveness. The blood of Jesus Christ really does cover our sins, and he forgets about our sins. And temporal punishment, there are typically you know, many kinds of you know, ways that we can do penance, but essentially you've got the traditional personal atonement of what? Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. By praying, fasting, and giving alms to those who are in need, we make atone for what we've done wrong. We atone for what we've done wrong, okay? Does that make sense? So this is, this is the whole background to going to confession and doing penance. All right, to ask forgiveness for our sins. Now, I think we've spent, we've spent plenty of time looking at objection one. But I do think it's important because, again, as I was saying at the beginning, people in our modern world, they deny sin, they try to explain it away, and so on and so forth. But this is what the church teaches. This is what scripture teaches. Sin exists. We just All we have to do is be humble and confess it, and God will forgive us our sins. Okay, so let's look at objection two. Does the Bible tell us to confess to a priest? What does the Bible say about this? Well, I want to look at a lot of scripture passages here because a lot, of, a lot of times it's important to not just prove it with one text, although one text would be enough. If we can show that it is a consistent teaching in scripture, then I think all of you are going to leave feeling quite comfortable. All right? Would you feel quite comfortable? Yeah, I think so. All right, so what does the Bible say? First and foremost, Jesus came to forgive us. There are numerous scripture passages here from Matthew, pardon me, from Matthew, Mark and Luke, Jesus came to forgive us our sins. Everybody knows that. That's common knowledge. And again, if we deny sin, then what's the point of the cross? If sin doesn't exist, why did Jesus suffer? But when we see what Jesus suffered for love of us, we have a greater understanding of how our sin hurts him. The, you know, we can't, as has happened unfortunately in history, Jews didn't crucify Christ. All of our sins put Christ on the cross. So again, Jesus came to forgive us of our sins. Now, the point here is, after Jesus ascended into heaven, how does this forgiveness, how does this method or this mission of reconciliation take place? Right? Do all we have to do is sort of like say, Jesus, I'm sorry? No. What happens is, when Jesus ascends to heaven, he gives his apostles the ministry of reconciliation. He entrusts his, the twelve and all of their successors with the task and the mission of bringing everybody, all nations, tribes, tongues, colors, races, and so on and so forth, to bring them back into rec- to the right relationship with God. The apostles have that authority. Just look at uh, this first scripture passage here in Luke chapter 10, verse 16. Jesus says to the apostles, whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me and the one who sent me. This is carte blanche authority right here. If you reject the apostle and their successors, right, because it's an office that you know, their successors take, fill, really, if they reject the apostles and their successors, they're, it's like rejecting Christ and rejecting God the Father who sent him. That's an incredible authority that Christ gives his apostles. Okay? So, what's important to point out is that the, the apostles have the authority not just to preach the ministry and the mission of reconciliation, and not just to interpret the gospel, because they have the authority to do that as well, but they have the authority to bring about this reconciliation. Not just preach it, but to affect it, to bring it about. That's a very clear distinction. Okay? And they do this, so the, the, the apostles way back when, 2,000 years ago, as well as the current bishops and all the priests, when they bring about forgiveness, when we go to confession and we just humbly accuse ourselves of what we've done wrong with just honesty, right? Jesus forgives us through his priest. There's an expression in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. The priest has the authority in Christ himself. No man, all right, just can just say, your sins are forgiven without the authority of Christ. It's really Jesus who forgives us through his minister. And that's very important to point out. So, let's look at this authority here. Let's sort of, you know establish once and for all this argument that this is all found in Scripture. First and foremost, the Catechism says this in paragraph 981. After his resurrection, 
Christ Jesus sent his apostles so that the repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. Okay, so far so good. The apostles and their successors carry out this ministry of reconciliation, not only by announcing to men God's forgiveness, but also communicating to them the forgiveness of sins in baptism, which we talked about very briefly at the beginning, and also reconciling them with God and with the church through the power of the keys. All right, so again, just as I was saying, not just preaching, but bringing it about through the power of the keys. What, are these, what, what does that mean, the power of the keys? It's like, here's some keys right here in my pocket. What keys are we talking about? Matthew chapter 16. Jesus gives Peter the keys to his kingdom. Okay? Check, everybody should have this passage memorized because this is a central scripture passage for the authority of the Pope, but of course also the, um, the other bishops in union with him. So, Jesus says, you are Peter, you are rock. Petros means rock. You are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of the, ne- of the netherworld, or the gates of hell, will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, I wish we had time to look at the Old Testament background of this, but essentially, Jesus comes to preach the kingdom of God. And if you look back at the kingdom of David, David had a prime minister who was pretty much, the only the king was greater than he, and he had the keys of the kingdom. So this is a direct quotation of Isaiah chapter 22, 22, if you want to go back later and look it up. But Peter is the prime minister for the kingdom of God, which is the church. All right, the kingdom of God is on heaven, in heaven and also on earth, and that's the Catholic church. And Peter's got the authority, Peter's got the keys to bind and to loose all right, and again, that's powerful language, actually bringing it about. So that's what the catechism is talking about. The priest can forgive our sins through the power of the keys. And the apostles have authority with Peter, with one key difference. Two chapters later, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says to all of the apostles, Amen, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Same language, but you'll notice there's something missing here, right? What? The keys. Only Peter has the keys. Only the Pope has the keys because he's the head honcho, the grand puba, right? You've got to have a central head to lead the church throughout all the ages in the, as the vicar of Christ. But all the apostles have this power to bind and to loose, okay? Binding and loosing. We're going to look at this a little bit more as it, as it carries on into the next scripture passage. But those are very, very important to, to remember. So here, here's a, you know, a KO punch, in terms of where is it in Scripture. John, chapter 20, verses 21 through 23. Jesus had just risen from the dead. He appears to the apostles and he says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. So well, what more do we, why are we here? Absolutely, let's stop with that verse. There are more verses, of course, but I want to explain this a little bit. You know, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Remember, the apostles carry out Christ's mission of reconciliation. They are the ones who in his, uh, so he uses them as his ministers to forgive everybody and to bring everybody into one church. Now, what's interesting here is, I mean, it's pretty explicit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. The apostles might have the authority to forgive sins, but nowhere in this passage does it say that they have the power to read minds or to read palms. Okay? This implies very clearly oral confession, right? How are the apostles supposed to forgive sins if they've never heard of the sins? All right? or, or, or not forgive sins if they don't know what they are? The apostles have the authority. Any priest can refuse absolution if there's not genuine repentance. If a man commits murder and refuses to, to turn himself in, the priest can say, I'm not giving you absolution until you make this right. Turn yourself in, admit your guilt, and so on and so forth. Okay, so it's a, sim- a similar language here of what we just saw in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18. The, the apostles have this authority to forgive sins, to bind, to loose, not only on earth, but also in heaven. Pretty powerful stuff, right? Okay, let's just look at a, a, a couple of more here. There's this really interesting story in Matthew chapter 9, When Jesus comes across a paralytic, and the the paralytic, what what does he want more than anything? To walk. Okay? He wants to walk. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. You can almost imagine him saying, well, that's great, but I kind of want to walk here. All right? And all the crowds get very, very upset because they see very clearly 
who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus says, why are you, why are you scandalized by this? Is it, what's easier, to say get up and walk or to say your sins are forgiven? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then turns to the paralytic and says, rise, take up your mat and go home. And he does. Because it's easy to say, right, your sins are forgiven. I can say to you, your sins are forgiven. Do we know if her sins are forgiven or not? You can't see that. There's no physical evidence of that. But if she couldn't walk and I said, get up and walk, there's, there's evidence, okay? But Jesus heals not only the body, but also the soul. And the last scripture passage in this, in this story is really interesting. It says, and when the crowd saw it, they glorified God who had given such authority to men. Why is this? Because the whole rest of this chapter, going into chapter 10, is all about Jesus giving the authority to the apostles. It's, it's really quite amazing how, how this happens, how Matthew presents it. But Jesus has the power to, for, to heal physically and to heal spiritually. And when you read the Acts of the Apostles, do you not see the apostles healing physically all over? I mean, from Acts chapter 1 to the very end. And they also have the, the power to forgive sins. They are his ministers. Okay, moving on. Ministers of reconciliation, I keep saying this phrase, the catechism uses it. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul uses this language here. Paul says this, All of this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ, as if God were appealing through us. So we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. This is, this is the whole purpose of the church, to be ambassadors, to be a, it's a sacrament of salvation, all right? to go out and to bring people to be reconciled with God again. We're in the business of saving souls. That's what the church is all about, to save souls. Okay? So you've got all of this language here, that God um, gave the apostles and their successors this ministry of reconciliation. I have one more scripture passage for you, just in case you're still doubting. Some of your faces look like you're still... No, I'm just joking. All right. James chapter 5. Interestingly enough, this is very much connected with the sacrament of he- the other sacrament of healing, uh, anointing of the sick. James says this. Is any of you sick? Well, he should summon the presbyters. It's a Greek word. for It also comes into our English. It means priests. Summon the priests of the church, and they should pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. That's the other sacrament of healing right there. It used to be called extreme unction. I mean, anybody, if you're sick, anybody can get this sacrament. I've received it a few times. All right? The power, I mean, Catholicism is not an, a non-biblical language or a biblical religion. I mean, it's fully biblical. No non-Catholic Christian religion can say Catholicism is not biblical. Okay? So we just looked at a whole lot of scripture passages. But I just want to point out just one more thing, and that's the historical context. I have two quotes from early church fathers. I could give you a whole bunch of them, but I know we have to leave in about 20 minutes. So just two quotes for you from the very early centuries that confession to priests was in practice. It's not something the church made up in the Middle, the middle Ages. All right, so Tertullian says this. Regarding confession, some flee the, from this work as being an exposure of themselves, all right? Or they put it off from day to day. They procrastinate. See, so procrastination's been around forever, right? Okay. So, he goes on. He says, I presume they are more mindful of modesty than of salvation. Like those who contract a disease in the more shameful parts of the body and shun making themselves known to the physicians. Get this. And thus they perish along with their own bashfulness. So in other words, if you contract a disease physically and you're, you're ashamed to present yourself to the doctor, you might die of that disease. Why? Because you're bashful, you're shy, you're afraid, whatever it might be. Spiritually speaking, if you, if you pretty much commit grave sin and you either gravely wound your soul or you kill it entirely and you just out of embarrassment for the sin, you refuse to present yourself to the physician, i.e. the priest, you're going to perish along with your own bashfulness. Pretty powerful language. One more for you. The testimony of the early church. Part two, this is origin. A final method of forgiveness, he says, albeit hard and laborious, because sometimes it can be, is the remission of sins through penance. When the sinner does not shrink from declaring his sin to a priest of the Lord and from seeking medicine after the manner of him who says, 
uh, who say, I said to the Lord, I will accuse myself of my iniquity. So what we have here, I mean, again, it's sort of like in the early church, you see the forgiveness of sins is accomplished through, number one, baptism. But again, if you sin after baptism, what? Confessing to a priest. All right. Anybody have any more doubts here? All right. It is hard and laborious. So let's, that brings us exactly into objection three. Why not go to God directly? Sort of embarrassing. I mean, if you don't have serious sins, so like, yeah, I screamed at my, my, my daughter because she was being extremely annoying, and, and that's the extent of it. I mean, yeah, it's embarrassing, but it's not like, yeah, I, I went out and I stole money, or I, I was in trouble on the computer seeing stuff I shouldn't see, or I, uh, I was gossiping and I destroyed somebody's reputation. I mean, some things are quite you know, embarrassing. So why not go to God directly and just confess to him and just save yourself the embarrassment? i got six reasons for you, okay? Six reasons why you should go to a priest. First and foremost, I've got to keep something in mind. When we confess to a priest, we ask forgiveness not only from God, but also we ask forgiveness from the church as well. Because when we sin, we sin, hurt not only God, who is our father, but we hurt the church, who is our mother. And the more you understand a little bit about the, the mystical body of the church, the way we're all connected with each other, when I sin... I hurt you as well, spiritually. I hurt the church as well, spiritually speaking. Now, on this point, I, I want to say something. that The church doesn't say, only go, to a, only go to a priest. Don't confess your sins to God. The church actually recommends both. It's a both and approach. And in fact, there's this very beautiful um, habit that we're all encouraged to do, and that is, before you go to bed, you say your what? Your prayers, right? And you give a little examination of conscience. Lord, how did I do today? Am, am I choosing you above all, all, all else? How can I improve? What did I do wrong? Did I hurt somebody? Can I improve my relationships or whatever it might be, okay? And so you give an examina- do an examination of conscience and say an act of contrition. So you're saying to God, I am sorry, all right? And you can do that for all the venial sins, the minor sins. You don't necessarily have to go to confession for those. It's recommended because you're deliberately trying to attack those things that are keeping you from God. The church does say, in, that, in this case, that when you commit a grave mortal sin, you have willingly, willfully turned away from God to fall into whatever it is that was tempting you, then you've got to go to confession first and go right away. Get restored with God and, give, and be restored as well with the church. Okay, so that's a very important distinction. When we go to Mass and we receive the sacrament in a state of preparation and prayer, our venial sins are forgiven. Our mortal sins aren't. You've got to go to confession to, to have forgiveness for a mortal sin. It's actually, actually a sacrilege to go and receive communion in a state of mortal sin. It's another grave sacrilegious sin. Anyways, we can't get into that. So that's the first reason. We have to ask forgiveness from the church as well. The second reason is that we obtain graces through the sacrament all right, that we can't get privately. The sacraments, in a nutshell, they actually they are channels of God's grace, channels of God's life. When we celebrate the sacrament worthily, with humility and honesty, as a child approaches a father, we get an, an increase in the grace of God. You can't do that. I can't confess my sins privately, you know, kneeling at my bed and get graces. I mean, there are... Again, there's always distinction, actual graces, and so on and so forth. But the point is, when you go to confession, the, the power of God is strengthened within your own soul. All right. Let's move on to number three, the third reason. We have the assurance of forgiveness. All right? Thumbs up, right? We have the assurance of forgiveness. Now, you might not think this is an important reason, but let me tell you, a lot of people really struggle with their own forgiveness. All right? Especially if it's been a problem, a struggle, and does God really forgive me? Has God forgiven me for what I've done? Some people can't even forgive themselves, and they struggle with God forgiving them, you know? You might have heard of people, or maybe you struggle with that. I don't know. But when you go to confession, and and the priest says, I absolve you of your sins, that is Christ forgiving you through his minister. And let me tell you, I don't know if anyone here has had this experience, but a number of times I've gone to confession and walked out feeling like I'm on cloud nine, feeling really good, like literally a weight has been taken off my shoulders, all right, because again, let's face it, we're all sinners. Go to confession, get absolution. Wow, complete difference. Okay. Number four, why go to a priest? We're held accountable. No excuses here, all right? Um, again, stealing another line from Matthew Kelly, we have a phenomenal ability to deceive ourselves. Do we not? Don't we have an ability to justify our actions, to say it really wasn't all that bad, or I screamed at that person and gave them, flipped them the bird? They deserved it. He was a jerk. We're held accountable. I mean, 
when we're just, it's just God and I, or just God and one person, we could just deceive ourselves very, very easily. But if we go to a priest, especially regularly with the same priest, you're held accountable. Yes, I did wrong. It doesn't matter that the person was a jerk. I reacted, and I was a jerk in response. We're held accountable, no excuses. Number five, the fifth reason why we should go to a priest is that we can receive instruction and guidance in the storms of life. All right, so you've got this kind of a pretty image. New, as New Englanders, I think you might appreciate the lighthouse. Look, um, when things are going bad, you need advice, you need counsel, you need direction. A priest, uh, not all priests are good confessor, confessors. Let's admit it, let's be frank. All right? Some priests are not good confessors, but many of them are good. Uh, so if you go to a good priest, he can help give you direction, all right, to help you, give you ways and guidance and advice to overcome temptation in the future. And finally, related to this, the sixth reason, it's free. I mean, people spend billions of dollars on self-help books, on psychiatrists and shrinks, and most of them aren't even really all that good. And they don't have the spiritual element to, to psychology. It's just, again, explaining it because biological reasons, or your parents, or this, that, and the other thing. No responsibility. I've never seen a tip jar, all right, in front of a confessional. Have you? Have you seen a tip jar? No. Have you seen like a slot you put in your your 50 cents or a dollar in order to open up the door and go into confession? No. I mean, confession is free. You get guidance, you get direction from a good priest, all right, and you're able to overcome your weaknesses and become better men and women of God. All right, so on that point, I have one more joke to share with you about like it's free. Confession is, is it just there for all of us. There was an Irish man. Yes, it's an Irish joke, all right? We're near the Boston area, so maybe some of you will appreciate it. An Irish man goes into the confessional. He's been away from confession for a long time. So he walked in, and he was amazed to find a fully equipped bar, Guinness on tap, okay? On the other wall, there's the best chocolates and cigars in the world. He was amazing. At that moment, the priest walked in. He goes, Father, you know, I've been away for, for a while, but it's, it's good to see that things are changing. You know, this is, the confessional box is different than what it used to be when I was a child. And the priest simply replied, get out, you're on my side. <laughs> no, the, the priest doesn't have all of all those things naturally, of course, but it's good to end with a joke. So, to wrap it up then, my final thoughts is, you know, your kids are going to see you and your spiritual life and be guided by that more than any retreat, more than any talk. They're going to see you. And look, I've got a, a daughter. She's 22 months. Okay, She's starting to repeat and do everything that I do. Being a role model is extremely important. Is it not? Yeah, so you got one of those. All right, you know it. Okay, Children, I mean, I, I don't want to shock you, but look, children know hypocrisy when they see it, do they not? So if we're trying to teach them the faith and yet we're not living it, they're going to notice right away and it's not going to stick. So if, if I may, you know, you might forgive me, I encourage you, go to confession yourself. If it's been a long time, go to confession and, and heal whatever it is you need to heal and build your spiritual life because you'll, you'll appreciate it, you'll enjoy it, you'll see the effects in your own lives and your children will see it. So if you bring your children to confession, Go to confession yourself. Make it a family tradition. All right? Once a month is always really good. Make it like the first Saturday of the month. That's what we do in our family. Why? Well, because I don't know if you noticed, but time goes by pretty quickly. Right? So one month goes by, two, three, six. Like, oh, gosh, it's been a while since I've been in confession. Like, would you wait six months to shower? No, you wouldn't. You'd shower on a regular basis. Spiritually speaking, if your soul is dirty, you've got to go to confession a little bit because you begin to stink and it comes out in all different ways. Shorter temper, all right, a little bit meaner or whatever it might be. So in any case, that was my, I hope you don't pardon my, you know, my challenge there. But yeah, go to confession. Right over here, we've got some really great um, little flyers there, how to make a good confession. I believe in there too, like how to uh, develop a Catholic conscience. So we've got some good resources in that area. So, I thank you very much for being here. The Pope imparts his apostolic blessing for you. He really didn't, but um, anyways, I thought it was a good way to end. All right, so, um, so thanks. So, yeah, be there for your children, and thank you so much for bringing your children into confession. I mean, you deserve a congratulations for that, because how many parents aren't doing that? How many parents are not bringing their children to church and, and guiding them? So, you deserve to be congratulated on that.